So what I want to talk to you about today is um, when I talk about assurance, it's how do you make sure that the things that you want to have happen in your company, your organization really occur? So with that, I'm going to just walk through this stuff. Um, got a couple of videos at the end. Um, and you can tell from my bio, I spent 20, you know, 22 years in the military, another 13 with the FAA. So I'm, I've got kind of a government bent to some things in terms of leadership. But leadership is leadership, no matter where you go. And we're going to delve into some of that and some of the criteria. The thing that, um, from an assurance side is how are you making sure that things are, as you direct them, as you're asking them to be directed, and are they really being controlled in that manner? It's a somewhat rhetorical question because everybody says, well, I've got all these systems. Well, let's talk a little bit about, so you've got compliance assurance and risk management, and of course the middle, the middle part of that is what we're going to talk a little bit about. But I'm going to delve much further down into it. Leadership. Okay, so leadership, and this is purely sort of the academic side of it, is vision. Where are you going? Strategic plans, tactical plans, whatever it is. But it's the other side of its resources. It's belly buttons and dollars or euros or whatever it's going to be. That's what a leader does. They provide vision and provide resources. You can really cut it down into those two things. But the next thing that I've always been challenged with is how do you do that? It's easy for people to walk in, and you can go to any one of these courses here today, and they're going to tell you what you need to go do. You need to put in an SMS, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. The challenge that I always saw in leading organizations, um, at um, my previous employer, I had responsibility for systems engineering, engineering operations, and flight operations. Now, that's a pretty wide remit. So how do I, how do we, as a leadership team, ensure that what we are asking to be done flows throughout the organization? So, leadership is hiring, in a nutshell. Now, my, my sort of waterfall event was when two of my uh, direct reports got promoted, one retired, and the other one got transferred to another area. So there I was with needing, needing to get a new executive assistant, two directors and two managers inside of six months. Now, if that's not a challenge, I don't know what was. And so I was struggling with what do I do? How do I make sure, because I now have a clean slate, how do I get the right team in place? Because I don't have time to make mistakes in the hiring process, not at the director level and certainly not at a manager level. Anybody know how much a bad hire costs? Okay, there are experts out there that will tell you up to seven times the annual salary of the individual if you make the wrong hire. And most people go, well, how do you figure that out? Well, first of all, you don't have anybody in the role. So either you're doing that role yourself or somebody's acting in that role. So you've got a divided set of loyalties there in terms of execution. So you go through all the process with HR and everything else of doing the hiring itself. You bring the person on board. You train them. And if it doesn't work out, You've now got all that sunk cost, time and effort, loss of productivity, and you're starting over again. So you can look at this and sort of say, is seven times the annual salary the right number? Don't know, but I can guarantee you it's least the annual salary of that individual. And that's money that you might as well have thrown out the window. So why don't we put the resources up front and hire right the first time? The second part of this is how do you make a team? And I'll talk more about that at the end. But one of the things that we struggled with was you've, got, you've assembled you know, four brand new leaders. How do you move this team from just knowing each other to a high tempo, especially given some of the things that we were involved with at the time? I did not have time at the, you know, to sit there and coach all four of them along at the same time. It wasn't going to happen. So a couple of tools that we came across. And the last one is, how do you create a culture of success? And culture is really the hard part. It's, it's where leadership, I, as I say, meets the rubber on the road at the same time. So then what? All right. So learners, excuse me, leaders are learners. 
if you're a leader, you have to be committed to constantly learning. I cannot emphasize that enough. My wife is always frustrated by the fact that I'm watching the History Channel or I'm watching mega ships or something like that. I'm always in tune to see if there's something out there, a better way of doing something that I don't understand. I learned a lot watching how ships were built. And when I was with a major OEM, I, I'm a pilot. I didn't know the first thing about heat treating or CAD plating or any of those sorts of processes. So I had to sort of learn on the fly. Colin Powell will tell you that he learned and he's still learning today. If you haven't read Powell's book, I highly recommend it. Okay, two books that I'm gonna push. This one is called Who. You can get it out here. You can get it at Amazon. Um, it's absolutely the right, and I'll, we'll go through this and I'll talk more about that. And then the next one is Strength Finders. So we'll talk more and that's on the team side of the equation. Okay, what are you going to hire? So let's talk about something. Okay, if you have, most of us all have cars, right? So if your car got wrecked tomorrow, would you go buy the exact same car? Why not? Okay, so you would change your requirements, what you wanna go get, okay? Why is it any different when you replace an employee. Has the job absolutely stayed static? Now, in some cases it might. I'm, I'm, I don't want, I mean, perhaps something like a call center. But if you think about it from a leadership standpoint, are the duties that this person did and what the job has evolved into exactly the same? My contention is no, they're not. So you really need to look at what is the need. So if you go further into that, the, the book, and I highly encourage you to use it. Um, Greg introduced it to us last year here. Um, I went back and read it, and one of my managers was in the middle of hiring somebody, and we said, well, let's just trial this and see how it goes. It was a success. So you've got three things, mission, outcome, and competencies. You have to sort of go off to the side someplace for four hours and sit down with nobody interrupting you and do this work because it's probably the most important four hours you're gonna spend in terms of trying to hire somebody. Um, we'll talk a little bit about systemic sourcing and different ways of doing that, and then the interview process. So the scorecard, what is this person going to do? What is it you want that person to do for you? And you only need to fill in four or five lines. You know, it can be bullet points, it doesn't make any difference but you have to sit down and write this down. You just can't go, oh, I want them to do da, 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 da. That doesn't work. Because you have to convey this into some format that HR will eventually go out and hire somebody or you will hire somebody at. What must get done? And you have to really be deliberate about this. Reports have to be finalized and sent to the CFO by the 19th of the month. What are those tasks that have to be done in order for that to be a successful position? And you wanna make sure you're not doing that job. Colin Powell will tell you, if I'm doing your job, one of us is redundant, and he would say, and it ain't me. You have to look at it that way. It is not your job to coach somebody through constantly in doing that job. It needs to be very clearly defined. How is the job to be done? What are the efficiency metrics? What are the cost metrics that, that go into it? And part of that is also is attitude. Is it efficiency? Is it streamlining? Is it gotta have a sense of humor? Do they have to be able to think on their feet? What are they? And you can go find competencies, but you need to be able to sit down and say, what are those competencies that somebody has to demonstrate? I can tell you, I had an assistant one time, absolutely lovely person, but because I was working in four different areas, she struggled to figure out what it was I was doing. And finally she said, you know, I just can't keep up with this. And it's not, it doesn't make them a wrong person or a bad person. They needed a little more structure and we were able to accommodate that. But that's where you have to be honest about what it is that you need in your team. Okay, A players hire A players. 
All right, and so an A player being a top of the line manager or leader. Would you go hire somebody? So ask yourself the question. The guy that you know doesn't cut it. Would you hire them? No, you wouldn't. So don't accept second or third or fourth when you're in the hiring process. A managers are not intimidated by people smarter than them. My dad used to say, if you're not the smartest guy in the room, go find them and hire them. It's absolutely imperative that you take your ego and you tuck it into your rucksack and not let that be a discriminator in hiring. Go find the smartest person in that area. And we'll talk about why that's important from a team composition. Okay, so General Jack Horner was the air combat commander during the Gulf War, right? Always on TV. Who was the land component commander? And it wasn't General Schwarzkopf. Anybody know? See, nobody knows who he was, but he had three, he had one of the most dynamic um, core commanders, Gary Luck, underneath him. Calvin Waller was his name. But Calvin Waller was the, was the guy that was always quiet and was always the yin and the yang to Schwarzkopf. Schwarzkopf was big and bold and all the rest of that stuff. Calvin Waller was one of the smartest people that anybody I've talked to in the Army ever knew. But he was never going to be out front. That was not his role. Let's talk about interviewing. So when you start to talk with somebody about it, so you, know, you, post, a, you, know, you post a requisition on the system or whatever it is. So in the interview process, what you're trying to do is get into that person's head. Is this going to be a good fit for your organization? So you start out with questions like, what are your career goals? You're trying to find out what they want to do. Are they an A player? That's kind of the question that should be boring around in the back of your head. What are you good at professionally? You want to hear everybody's you know, got a good story to tell. In the book, one of the uh, CEOs says that he, he ended up letting a guy go. He said, because what I hired was your resume. What I got was you. And what that says is he really didn't do due diligence in the hiring process. What are you not good at or what don't you like to do? That's, that's important. I'm not a detailed guy. I can be if I have to be. But there are some people who absolutely love getting into every little nit and detail and stuff. But it's good to know what people's strengths are and what people's weaknesses are. The other thing, your reason you're asking this question is, if, I, if somebody says, I don't have any weaknesses, big red flag. Interview's about over. You don't need them. But you, as the hiring official, in building your team, have to be able to have that conversation with yourself and with the individual. There's a phrase that you'll see in the book, it's called torque. And it basically says, we're gonna do reference checking. It's threat of reference check. Read it, it says, who were your last five bosses and how will they rate you from one to 10 when we talk to them? You wanna put that person on notice, you're gonna talk to their bosses. Now, do you have to do it? Maybe. But what you want is an open, transparent conversation about why people either think they're good about what they're doing or how they would be rated or what they're not good at. But you have to use that quasi-threat. So, what, how, tell me more. Those are the three phrases that you need to learn when you're interviewing somebody. Open-ended questions. One time I was doing a hiring for an HR manager, and just something about this guy's application just didn't sit right with me. But we still brought him in, we interviewed him, and um, so here's, a, here's a, a, a plug for women. You should always have a woman on an interview panel with you. They're much more perceptive than men are. That's a fact. And we're going through this whole thing, and one of the ladies who was an HR manager, she would have been a peer, says, there's something about this guy that ain't right. I don't know what it is, I just don't get a good sense about it. So I, when, in, in asking sort of these questions, I went, was able to delve into finding out that there was, he had been suspended as a senior official in the, in the uh, federal government for 90 days. And I can never find out what, 
But the fact was, you don't want that sort of history in your organization. That's not a good trait to have. So you have to learn to ask these kinds of questions. Tell me more. How was that done? What were your duties? What made you think that about that? So those are the things you have to learn in their, from, in their open-ended questions. So back to this hiring, this guy we were gonna, almost going to hire. As I was still delving into the reference checks, and I'll talk more about that in a second, I talked to his boss, and he said, I don't answer open-ended questions. Can anybody say red flag? That's the reason you do this. So next interview. So you've gotten, him through, you've gotten people called through, say, maybe the first interview. Then you start out the second round of interviews. You start out with what were you hired to do in your last, and then you don't, you start this with, you go back eight to 10 years. You're gonna ask five questions, okay? And it's important you do it in the order because what you're trying to do is you're trying to build from where they were up to the most recent. So what were you hired to do? You need to keep good notes as you're doing this too. What accomplishments are you most proud of? Once again, you're trying to find out what people say. And again, you can sort of get a feel for what are the real particulars. You know, I um, brought XYZ to market, okay? Back to the how and why. How did you do that? What were your metrics? What was your budget? Were you ahead of schedule? Were you behind schedule? Tell me more about that. You delve into these things and you do it with each of the positions. What were some low points? Has anybody here ever done a project that everything went swimmingly, there was never a problem? Suppliers delivered on time, products shipped on time, stuff got where it was supposed to go? I don't see anybody jumping up and down. So we've all had low points in positions, right? That's what you want. You want to find out if this person can accurately assess what they either did well or did not do well. And I did not do well, you have to understand that. That's all part of the transparency. Can they be honest with themselves? Are they gonna look in the mirror and call it the way it is? Because you're gonna find out later on, and I'll show you how. Okay, who are the people you worked with? The, the last one, how would you rate the team you inherited is important because it does two things for you. One is how well can you assess or how well does the individual assess what they got? Can they identify it? You know, and then, because part of that is if he says, well, I inherited, you know, a bunch of clowns, do you really want him saying that to the next interview about working with you? So it's all about trying to get a picture of how they are going to portray things. Now, let's just say it wasn't a stellar team. You say, well, you know, we had some challenges. There are a couple things that didn't work real well. You know, are they somewhat self-deprecating? Are they gonna really just eat cheese all over people? Because if they're gonna do that, they're gonna talk bad about your organization, guaranteed. Last question, why did you leave the job? Best answer in the book was Jamie Dimon. He said, I got fired. You know, he's one of the bank presidents. But it's very interesting because he said, I just didn't get along with the guy and I got fired. Do you have transparency? Yeah. Did he tell you exactly what happened? Yeah. I like a guy like that. At least you understand what's going on. So the third interview. Okay, this is to talk about competencies. If you have got any questions as we're going along here, please feel free to jump up and ask as we go along. Competencies. That's the ability to execute against a given set of skills. So, um, I was trying to think, so accuracy in a budget. You know, can somebody sit down and write a budget that is realistic? Budgets don't have to be perfect. Good Lord, I mean, look at the, the federal budget. How long has it been since we've had one? What are your biggest accomplishments in this area? And you're talking about some of the, comp the competencies. Is it program management? Is it um, financial accountability? Um, you know, what is it? But again, you've got to delve into this to get to the bottom of it. What are your insights? Everybody should be learning, and back to the reason you do this from sort of their first job that you can get a hold of forward, is you want to see what they learned. 
So you're asking these, this series of questions. Okay, so the last one is, so you've finally gotten to the point where you think this is the person that has the right skills, um, they've got the right competencies, um, but the, the, the last thing, and it's probably the most important, is reference checking. How many people actively check references? Okay, it should be 100% to be candid with you. I'll tell you a great story. So I was hiring a manager for a manager position. Um, I asked for three references from all the, 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 the five people that came. One of the first references I checked with, this individual said, I can't believe that person used me as a reference. We didn't get along and I had to ask that person to leave. Now, that's not a very glowing reference. So one of the first things that you wanna do is make sure that somebody you would think would have thought through that. That pretty much to me said, that this is probably not the person I wanna move on to the next stage. So, but for the protection, so one of the things that this process also does for you is it gives you a good audit trail with your records if you ever get challenged by legal or civil rights or, those, or labor or one of those types of people that says, you know, you just hired your buddy because you've got all the documentation. First question. And these are open-ended questions and it's really important that you follow the, the, the verbiage in this. Again, discuss strengths. And it's important that you use the term back then, okay? And the reason that that's important is you wanna give people a chance to learn. Lord knows, when I was a second lieutenant, I made some really, really dumb mistakes. I really wouldn't want to be held accountable today for some of the mistakes I made back then. And everybody gets a pass on that, but that's the reason you say back then, because people learn from their mistakes, hopefully, as they move through their careers. And then you wanna put some sort of a metric on it, one to 10. Explain, what did they do well? What didn't they do well? From earlier in the brief, in the uh, interview process, you should have their weaknesses that they've talked about. So you ask the reference. They said they struggled with um, holding people accountable. How about discussing that? I would suspect most of us have a hard time with that. Does anybody like having a hard conversation with somebody? I don't. That would be something I would have to say. Have I learned to do it? Yeah, but I don't like it. Okay. So that gets you kind of through the, um, the hiring process. But one of the things that you also want to do is you want to make sure that somebody that you're going to bring on board will also be a good member of a team. And so the book Strength Finders by Tom Rath. So the point that Rath makes is he works for the Gallup organization and they were actually doing um, some work with the university and the incoming freshman class, they were giving them reading comprehension tests and they found out that they had this, you know, some people read really well and then others didn't. Then they gave them a bunch of training and they retested them. And what skewed the data that created this whole uh, opportunity with RATH and the, the, the Gallup organization was the good readers got significantly better. And the ones that were poor readers only got a little bit better. And so they started looking into this and they, and you can check the numbers in the book, but I mean, there's something like 40,000 opportunities to look at all this stuff. And what their, their thesis was, and it turns out is, instead of focusing on people's weaknesses in a team environment, focus on their strengths. You know, people, you know, furrowed brows, well, what do you mean? Okay, so in the book, these are the strengths. So you, you buy the book, it's 22 bucks or something like that on Amazon or something like that. And then you get this, these things right here. So achiever, arranger, belief, and you've got activator and all the rest of these things. Um, notice over here, it's got learner. 
Well, that's one of my strengths. So what this does, and it can be further broken down once you get in the team, is in terms of executing, influencing, relationship building, or strategic thinking, these skills line up in this area. So that's kind of like the master's level of this. But it's important when you build a team that you have people with skills from all four of these areas. Because if you have people with just, say, strategic thinking and influencing, you don't have anybody that's got, I want to get it done in there. Now, Gateway Church in South Lake, Texas is one of the mega churches, and they have 400 pastors on staff there. They have six locations in the United States. So you would think, okay, so what's a church got to do with leadership? Well, again, back to learning and leading. A church will grow to 400 people based on a single pastor. That is the limit of their, their capacity to do that. If a church is going to grow beyond that, and the reason churches are a great example from a leadership standpoint is pretty much it's an all-volunteer organization. So between the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, and the church, those are your biggest leadership challenges if you're going to execute. So they actually have two people on staff, coaches in this area, and they don't do any projects unless they have people with skills in all four areas. And it's interesting, the senior pastor has stuff in here and here, but he's got nothing in here and nothing in here. So guess what? The executive pastor, so the number two guy, has stuff in here and stuff in here. Kind of makes sense in terms of building a team. So at our organization, we did this and didn't come across as well as I liked it to, but we have at Aerosafe and our four executives, that's our composition. And then you can see some of these are a little bit darker. So we have got a pretty good mix there, which says that we believe we're pretty well situated in terms of a balance across the executive team. But you also look and see that we've got intellection, learner, and strategic. We've got several things where people have three. So a lot of relators, a lot of learners, a lot of strategic thinking. So what that says to us is we just need to be careful of the fact that we, we, we're kind of heavily weighted in the strategic thinking side. So it's just something to be aware of. But what that says is we know what our strengths are from an organizational standpoint. So back to the hiring side of stuff. So at the, this, my, my last employer, a former OEM, when we did this, the same composition, what we found was m four of the five of us had responsibility. I was the only one that didn't. But what that said to me as a leader was, I didn't have to worry about somebody going off and doing something that I've asked them to do or they need to go do. They, they'll take that responsibility and run with it. So what happens oftentimes in a new organization, you have somebody new, you, you check, right? Because until you, you, know, you see that they actually get stuff done, you're still kind of got your tail hanging out a little bit in the wind. Well, what it said to me was I didn't have to worry about that as a leader. I automatically knew that those things were going to get taken care of, and it jump-started us. I didn't have to worry about checking on things. I could get on to the stuff that I needed to take care of. But it taught us also something else when we looked at the composition in that team um, in our systems engineering organization. I had a guy that was a real big thinker and engineering operations, but engineering operations in an OEM is a very detailed-oriented job. So that meant that really what we had to have was somebody to balance that out. So when we did, we had four managers to select from, we did exactly the same process. So what we lo were looking for was somebody to balance out the other side of that equation. And at first blush, the person that really came out as being the correct person from this standpoint, a lot of people didn't think would be the right person to go do that job. It turned out he was absolutely the, the perfect person to go do that job. Absolutely excelled in that role because he was a detailed person. So when you're sitting back as a leader trying to figure out back to the assurance side of stuff, how do you execute? How do you get your mission accomplished? The things that you've got to do. Well, that's all part of it. So let me talk about culture for a second. Because culture is the, the, the bread and butter. 
It really is. So I've got a video or two I want to show you. So let me set this up. Um, the first video I'm going to show, and I want to hopefully, I won't get this, the, the bikini ad that I got earlier, um, was sent to me by my son. Okay, and he's done two tours in Iraq, and he said, Dad, you ought to see this, it's pretty cool. And then it triggered in me the question that I'll ask in a second. This is the funeral of a New Zealand Defense Force infantryman. get the idea. Okay, so let me, so the question that I was posing was, how do you get that? How do you get that warrior ethos, you know, into an organization? And I don't care whether you're, you know, whether it's the military or whatever it is. And so it posed a big question for me. <laughs> taught it to him in basic training. Now think about that for a second. How, how do you, as a leader, grow a culture? Say it again. Esprit de corps, okay? I can think of a lot of examples. Um, the U.S. Army, Rangers, you know, Rangers lead the way. The Night Stalkers. I mean, they, they all have their ethos, and, and a lot of this is based in the military, I get that. But the leadership lessons don't change. What they were doing with those kids, and they were kids, they're 18, 19 years old, it's part of their indoctrination. It's part of their onboarding process. 
to learn that spirit, that ethos. And I can just tell you that you can, you can talk about it from the top, but that's all you can really do is talk about it from the top. You have to lead an organization from the front. You know, uh, Tony Kern was talking about that yesterday, and I don't know whether people caught it, was he was saying, you can't just talk about these kinds of things in an organization. I had structural test labs, so I had an area as big as this entire ballroom that looked like a giant erector set. Some of the biggest pieces of machinery I've ever seen, capable of millions of pounds of pressure and pull and breaking and bending and stuff. But when I walked through there, I always had my safety glasses on. Everybody was looking to see if Dave had his safety glasses on. Did, you know, or if we crossed an FOD line in the hangar, did I take off my badge? Did I take the pens out of my pocket? You lead from the front, but you also do that as a part of the onboarding process when you bring people aboard. You set expectations for them as a leader, and they don't need to hear it down the chain of command. They need to hear it from the person that has the highest expectation of them. You know, it's, you know, you can, you can comment all you want to about, you know, I'll, and I'll kind of put political leaders out to the side. But if you look at cultures today, look at the culture, let's pick DuPont. What is DuPont known for? A fanatical safety environment. Fanatical. And what happened, how did that happen? It started out in West Virginia when they had an explosion at a black powder factory. So what did they do? They moved the manager onto the facility. If you don't think that will keep your hearts and minds you know, centered on safety when your family lives right near the mine, absolutely that will change your perspective. And you should know, do nothing less nor expect nothing less from your chain of command or from yourself as a leader. So, you create, then you influence, and you shape. And the shaping part of it is, you, 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 it's not really sequential. It's about hiring the right people at the various stages throughout the organization. It's about hiring A managers or A leaders. There's a difference between managing and leading, and let me be clear about that. You manage programs, you lead people. Now, you may have both duties, but when people say you don't pay attention to what's going on, Every day, I, was, I felt like I was expected to come to work at the FAA, you know, you know, shaved, you know, hair combed, starch shirt and tie and everything else. And we were doing a United Way promotion, and they said, okay, um, will you get in one of those dunking tanks? And I said, sure. You know, so it was gonna be like a buck a tennis ball to dunk me. So I got up there, and this girl walks up with a $20 bill, puts it on the table and slams the thing. She says, I wanted to see your hair wet, period. People pay attention. They know what you're doing as a leader. They know if you show up on time. They know if you take an hour for lunch and you're supposed to take 30 minutes. They know if you go home early. Do you know the names of the spouses of your employees? How many kids they have? Do you really have ownership of them as a part of the organization, not just as an employee, but are you bought into them in everything that they do? Do you know when their birthdays are? If you don't, you should. Celebrate those things with them. You would be surprised, and they'll talk a lot in the book if you read into there, about oftentimes the commitment, and I didn't go into that in here, but Closing the deal on hiring somebody is more often than not getting the commitment from the spouse, not from the prospective employee. And the only way you learn to do that is to get inside of that organization. Because people are going to find out. They absolutely will. So, here are some concluding thoughts. You're only going to get out of this process in terms of hiring what you put into it. I can tell you, I'm going through this right now, and I've probably spent 20 hours on two positions. 
because I have high expectations of the two people that I'm going to hire. Do your homework. Can't stress that enough. You can't just, you know, you can't just throw something on the table and expect that's going to, you know, you're going to get an A player out of that. It isn't going to happen like that. And then culture, you can say it starts at the top. It starts at the top in terms of demonstrating it, being responsible about it, being accountable for it. But everybody's going to look at what you do. And with that, I'll take questions or comments. Yes, sir. I would agree with you. So, so the question is, how do you how do you create leaders? Leaders are learners. There are, I would tell you that I probably became a much better leader after I left the military because in the civilian side of the federal government, um, but my object lesson was three days into my working in the FAA and I saw this piece of paper said suspense 27 September and I walked next door to the guy that had, I said, hey, we got a suspense. He goes, that don't mean anything. And I went, whoa. That's a big change from the military to the government. You can learn to be a good leader. You can go find mentors. They're there. They will help you. I regularly had four to five mentees in my last position. And I, and I invested in those people. And the reason that you have to do that, if you're in a leadership position or you're aspiring to be a leader, go find somebody that you think emulates those traits that you think best fit being a leader. Not a manager, but a leader. And there's a ton of books out there that you can go read. I'd go read Powell's book, just for a start. I mean, it's great. You just type in Colin Powell in Google, Colin Powell PowerPoint, it'll come up. There's a 44-page PowerPoint presentation that he talks about leadership. You know, you can read Covey's book. I mean, there's a ton of books out there that you can read, but mentoring, um, there are programs in most cities, the Chamber of Commerce or those types of organization have mentors. My wife has four mentees in her role from the church, but that's not about religious mentoring, it's about growing people. So mentoring, I think, is probably a real key. As a leader, you have to do that. If you're an aspiring leader, go find a mentor. And they're out there, there's programs that, will, that you can find. Somebody else had a question? If not, thank you very much.